Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to not just another episode of the Lockdown Padres podcast, but yet another crossover. It is also another episode of the Locked On Cleveland Guardians podcast. I am one of your hosts, Javier Reyes, of course, sometimes occasionally, but certainly not always the host with the most. You can find me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, and I'm being joined by the legendary who he's been hosting the pod for a while. He is a, a prospect guru and he is a Cleveland guru and occasionally even a star Wars guru. Dare I say it is Mr. Jeff Ellis, sir. How are you doing? I mean, I got, I got the X wing there and the yeah. Darth Malgus <laughs> down there. So, uh-huh. um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, I had totally blanked that we already had a trade, uh, yeah, me too. organizations, <laughs> but, uh, it feels like there's always more coming when it comes to the guardians and, and the Padres. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about that first. We're going to talk about the little bit of a swap that the Padres and the Guardians make. Talk a little about the Guardians as a whole and what's the state of that team. And of course, talk about what is probably going to be the thumbnail and title of this episode, Mr. Shane Bieber, uh, who has been on the trade block for what feels like three years now. Uh, but first, let's talk about uh, just the general uh, trade. Let's get into that first. A couple weeks ago, the, the Padres and the Guardians made a swap. And we've done a lot of crossovers over the years because yes. our teams just tend to love to trade for each other. And I think that there's a bunch of reasons for that. You can go down the route of Padres aren't good at developing pitching while the Guardians are. And, you know, the Guardians seem to not necessarily have all the offense in the world. And the Padres love getting, uh, you know, big giant players. So it's just they seem to be a match made in heaven for at least for those their their perspectives. But Eniel De Los Santos in exchange for Scott Barlow. Um, a, a minor swap. I think that the big part of this was for the Padres is that they are shedding salary right now. They need to get under 200 million. million. Yeah. Um, they need to figure that out. That's why Soda's been on the trade block. I've talked about that on plenty of episodes this week. You can go check them out on the channel or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, what was your reaction to this trade? I think we're all like, what? Like you know, on a very basic <laughs> level, just because it's, one, uh, you know, Cleveland got rid of former Padre, uh, Cal Quantrell, for yeah. almost nothing. Um, if we're being honest, like they, they got a a 23 year old in low A catcher who, you know, by all accounts was, you know, the best defensive catcher there. But, um, you know, it's uh, the Rockies are weird. And uh, for whatever reason, their development uh, cycle didn't push a player up that they probably should have. But they got a guy who's not going to even break their top 20, probably not their top 30 prospects for Cal Quantrell. Now, Quantrell. Metrics have hated him for years. Um, he did not have a great year. He ended strong, though. But it, most people saw that as a money-cutting move because much like the Padres went through last year, Cleveland's going to – the TV contract is up in the air. They're probably going to end up doing the same thing San Diego did. Cleveland did get their $55 million guaranteed last year. That's not happening this year. Um, yeah. So yeah, – but after cutting Quantrell – or not cut it. Well, I mean, they waived him and then traded him. Mm-hmm. Uh going and adding $5 million to get Scott Barlow. Now we, we had heard on our show that any De Los Santos was a guy who was talked about multiple times, specifically with the Cubs. The Cubs had been kind of trying to acquire him on the cheap and uh, it didn't come together. Uh, I did not expect Barlow. I, it, what it feels like is Cleveland traded what two, three years of control of a, listen, any was signed right before the lockout. Well, not right before like the, the, the season of the lockout. And he was a guy who could not stick with the Phillies. Cleveland worked with him and he became a solid reliever. Is he anything special? No, but is he a guy who's only making a million, who's reliable to be in that sixth, fifth, sixth inning role? hundred mm-hmm. uh, percent. And there's value in that. So they went for kind of the low ceiling of him versus, I mean, when Barlow was clicking, he was an amazing closer for Kansas city. Uh, he had some good moments for San Diego. Uh, it's just weird to trade for a guy who makes, it, we're not used to trading for an expiring contract that makes more money in Cleveland. Those things don't happen. That's why we're going to talk Shane Bieber on the show. It, it's the opposite is what happens. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, my general view uh, of it was they went for ceiling. They still hope to contend. I mean, you can look at the twins pitching staff falling apart and seeing why they think there's a chance uh, there. And, you know, if it doesn't work out and if you're Cleveland, maybe you can help Barlow recapture some of his, you know, height like when he was at peak and frankly elite relief pitchers are going to net you more like if barlow can get back to his near elite level 
that still nets you more than someone like Enya would at the deadline. So there's a chance where if Cleveland, it doesn't work out, but you're able to fix this guy. And typically they're pretty good at identifying pitchers that they can sometimes tweak and get more out of. And if this is a player, they feel like they can do that for, they might just view this as a, Hey, he can help us now. And if it doesn't work out, we're going to elevate him and get more than we would have for Enya. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting perspective on it, that this could be potentially a guy at the deadline. I mean, the Padres acquired um, Scott Barlow at the deadline. He had some stuff. He, he started off really strong and then he got lit up a couple days after. I mean, this is just a mess of a season for the Padres in basically every way. Um, but for the Padres perspective, it's that they have to shed salary. Like I mentioned at the top of this. And if you look at just the base numbers, uh, Scott Barlow, um, the last two seasons, 1.9 F4, 3.22 ERA, 3.52 FIP. I know the Santos 1.7 F4, 3.18 ERA, 3.10 FIP similar numbers at the base level. I'm not saying that that means that they're the same or anything like that. You could dive deeper into these guys. Um, and I think that Barlow, like you said, the ceiling is much higher. I think people might forget, like, I think it's excluding this year was one of the five best ERAs among relief pitchers in baseball. I could be wrong about that, but he's been very, very good before. Um, and the Padres need to shed some relief. And like you said, the guardians, they're, they're a team that is always sneaky with their moves. They're very smart. Um, and I think that I could see them netting something at the deadline while the Padres, I, I think this is just simply like a win-win for both teams potentially. Yeah. Um, and the Padres have been good at major league pitching uh, as of late. And I think that they have to retool their bullpen. And I think this was just a solid move for them. So it's cool. I'm fine with it. Sounds like you are too. Um, it, it's nice that you got him for a few years too. Like you can just put him yeah. in, forget it. And he's never, he's and, and like the underrated aspect is like Barlow has been a closer. And we know like when it comes to relief mm -hmm. pitchers that brings up arbitration rates, any out, never a closer. He's going to always be kind of, he's never going to get anywhere near what Barlow has gotten in arbitration. So he's exactly. kind of cost controlled for three years as well. Mm -hmm. It's crazy that we're here. Padres, the big spenders, the ones that have been shaking up and throwing baseball out of whack are now trying to shed a little bit of salary. Not, not crazy. 200 billion. It's still a lot guys. Don't worry. It is when it's Cleveland um, on the other side. Being the yeah. team taking it, is, on it is a little crazy. Yeah. It's like very bizarre world compared yes. to what we've been talking about uh, previously, but obviously that is not the main entree. That is not the main course meal of today's podcast. Firstly, before we get into Shane Bieber specifically, what is the vibe of the Cleveland Guardians? And this is important because I f could be wrong, but I believe they were the division favorite uh, heading into the year. Um, and they have good players, uh, but it quickly kind of seems to have tail dived or nose dive, I should say, off a cliff in terms of Jose Ramirez still being a good player. Having one of his down seasons, I expect him to come back because he had a down season, I believe, in 2019. And then he went nuts in 2020 or the year after, whatever it was. Um, so I have no doubt about that. But Stephen Kwan not hitting for a lot of power. You had the Tristan McKenzie issue with him being in and out, um, basically being hurt for most of the year. So I'm wondering, what is the overall kind of vibe for this team and what I feel is still a very, very winnable division? You know, it, it's interesting to look at the fan base because it we a lot of the fans fixate on the fact that like Cleveland had the least home runs in baseball by a significant margin. Like, you know, the mm -hmm. Washington nationals, I think had like 30 more home runs in Cleveland. Uh, the offense was a mess and the rotation was hurt. Uh, you know, McKenzie, I think had 11 innings, maybe it got up to 15 Bieber missed half the year. Um, mm -hmm. you know, before they traded Savali, he missed a month. Quantrell missed two months. Uh, your fifth start at the start of the year was Zach Plesak, who got put on waivers and nobody wanted him. No one yeah. wanted to pay that dude two million dollars. No one even wanted yeah. to take a chance. And but the other side of it is the big three young arms all really stepped up. And if you want to get really excited, the the highest ceiling of of their uh, pitching prospects, the guy who has a legitimate Degrom esque ceiling. Like this time a year ago, we were talking about a guy with two seventy grade, pit, like listed as the best fastball and the best slider in the minors was Daniel Espino. Now there's a ton of risk, and there always has been. And uh, you know, I'm not saying he's going to be Degrom. I, I I would actually say he's not going to be Degrom. Uh, I, I would definitely lean that way, just in terms of that elite like seventy grade slider fastball combo. Mm -hmm. uh, but Espino was hurt, and he hasn't even debuted for them yet. So they have that big three. They still have four years of control with McKenzie. Maybe it's it's only three, but I, they, they have a essentially a cornerstone staff put together. And Joey Cantillo, speaking of Padres, I mean, we were looking through advanced data the other day, and 
his secondary offerings had some of the best swing and miss rates in the zone, you know, it, which is an important thing because then that means that if they don't swing it's a strike anyways of any pitcher in triple a, we, uh, someone we knew scraped all the, the stat cast data and put it in a nice little document. And we were uh, diving through all of it, trying to, you know, just look at that. And Cantillo could be the next guy up for this team. He said there's still a Spino and that's, the level of excitement um they still need hitters you know they flipped savale for manzardo and he was great in the afl but um you know, the afl is the afl we'll, we'll have to wait and see it's uh, it, was, it was good for guys with last names beginning with them between marxy and, and manzardo it was, it was a good afl uh but there's some pitching hitting is just it's we don't know what's gonna go on you know it, there was a lot of regression <laughs> Quan regressed jimenez regressed jose ramirez yeah. had, a, had a down year right. Josh Naylor um, can't, you know, he misses a month to two of the year with injuries. Bo Naylor mm -hmm. was fantastic, really started to get together. There, there's a lot of reasons for excitement, but then there's also like Miles Straw was, was bad. Cam Gallagher posted, I mean, he's not with this team anymore, but if, if you are like a stat nerd, like Cam Gallagher is fun to go look at because like his year was so bad. Like it, there's no historical precedent. Like no one has been mm -hmm. that bad. And, and we say this as a team that had Austin Hedges as our starters for a few years, who was uh, the worst hitter in baseball over a three-year period where he was the starter in Cleveland. Yeah. Uh, but Cam Why Gallagher not? was actually worse than most pitchers have been uh, during the, the last 40 years. My so there's, God. There's, yeah, it was, he put up numbers that were literally Ooh, my unmatched. goodness gracious. Yeah. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, it's. <laughs> It's oh fun. God. If you want to just go down a rabbit hole, Cam Gallagher's numbers uh, from last year. And he was worse than Ostadola. My God. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's he was due over a million dollars of arbitration. And people were like, are you sure they're going to let him go? I'm like, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're going to let the guy with the like negative 20 war or uh, <laughs> negative 20, not war. I'm sorry. Runs creative plus or whatever it was. He was it's bad. Negative 17. <laughs> negative 17. So it was close. It's it's it was something to watch. Um, not good, but it was something. Uh, so yeah, offensively, they're kind of a mess. Listen, Jose was still very good. Josh Naylor took a step forward. Bo Naylor is exciting. Andres Jimenez was average. Steve Kahn was average. I'll take average. Um, mm -hmm. but after that grouping, you know, Gabby Arias, another Padre guy, can he step mm -hmm. up? Uh, yeah. I mean, the, t the team kind of threw him under the bus at one point this year. Like, you know, like mm. a lot of information leaked out about work ethic and stuff like that. And he got benched and some negative Ugh. things said about Tito. Uh, or Tito said kind of relating to him and yeah, I it, shortstop is up in the air first base. We're hoping Manzardo will step in, but it's you're excited about some parts, but the offense is talking to fans on the show and through the show. It's like, that's what people are concerned about. And there's definitely a defeatist attitude in Cleveland. Like this team doesn't spend any money. They're not going to do anything. They always fail. Um, they're just going to be bad. It, <sighs> I understand. I understand. There's a lot to talk about for sure. And I think that, hey, Cleveland, they did do the Jimenez thing in fairness. He just didn't, you know, have happen to have a good season. But I think the Guardians have a lot of interesting pieces. And I think that as trade partners for Bieber, there's a lot to get into. But before we get into that, folks, I just want to take a second to talk about our good friends over at FanDuel. At the time of us recording this, the Seahawks and the Cowboys are playing apparently the game of the year. And if you picked... Well, at the time of this recording, we don't know who's winning, but who, if you picked I, the, let's say Cowboys are ahead by right now, if you picked them, guess what? If you had listened to our offer here for FanDuel, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. So if you bet the money line on the Cowboys, you are swimming in the dough. That's what you're doing. You're swimming. You're not just jumping. You're swimming in it. It's very fantastic over there. That's 150 bucks if your team wins. But it's not just money line bets. They've got you covered with everything else: spreads, player props, over unders, over under. I don't know what whatever catches for your one of your favorite receivers, um, Amari Cooper. Since we're talking Cleveland, maybe you want to bet the over on him this week. I don't know who the heck the Brads are playing at the boat, but whatever. You could do that. They have you covered. So, guys, go visit fanduelcom slash locked on and kick off your NFL season of betting. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right. We are back now. All right. So, there was a lot that you talked about with the Guardians. And I think that, yeah. first of all, you guys do have a great name theory player. I just want to give my outside perspective. And the name theory is, of course, just guys who have sick names. Xavion Curry. 
uh, being one of them. Uh, just an incredible name. I don't know if he's very good. I've just heard, and I've actually heard of him before this. And Daniel Los Santos was also a name theory guy, so I'm excited about that. You also have Ramon Laureano, who, do you remember when Ramon Laureano was, like, the top, like, not top, but it's like him and Brian Reynolds, I feel like, have been talked about in trade rumors so much. And Laureano had the suspension <laughs> that I feel like kind of, like, killed all of that. I don't know how he was exactly for the team, but when I look at your team, it's it's interesting because the Padres, for Shane Bieber, I imagine that they'd be willing to trade at least one of their pitching prospects. It seems like there's two right now between Robbie Snelling and Dylan Lesko. I don't think they want to give up Snelling. He seems to be a lot more further along. Uh, preferably, I don't know if they want to give up any, but I don't know if pitching prospects is what Cleveland would be going for right now, or though I could be wrong, but it seems like pitching is, it seems like the injuries. I mean, that's what you were saying. Like McKenzie barely pitches this year, right? Like they had some, some bad luck on that front. Do you think that they'd be looking for pitching prospects or offensive guys before we start getting into this? You know, I think offensive guys, I, I think pitching depth, uh, which mm. I know is not the, the Padre strong suit right now, No, but uh, <laughs> like, I feel like they probably want some depth because if you trade Bieber and then Xavier on Curry is probably your fifth starter. And he was okay in that role, a little overexposed. It's probably he's best as like a swing man, more of a, like he, he did really well in that kind of long role. Um, in the pen, Hunter Gaddis is their next guy up and hasn't gone great for him. Uh, you know, Cantillo could be the guy sooner rather than later, but yeah, there, you know, there's, I, I don't know who the depth option would be, but they're in a situation where it feels like they kind of need another play. I mean, they signed Jaime Barea the other day to a minor league deal to maybe help with that depth. But uh, yeah, it just gets really shaky after kind of that initial, the rookie, the three rookies in McKenzie. And uh, like I said, Curry is probably your fifth, Gaddis your sixth. And then your guess is as good as mine at that point. Yeah. And this is a trade that hasn't been like rumored. We just think that it's yeah. a fun thought experiment. And frankly, I don't know exactly if Bieber has been himself even it doesn't feel like there's been too much traction of late. It seems like Dylan Cease is the name of the week right now that's been tossed around a lot, uh, which I think it should be because I think the White Sox should be rebuilding. I don't know why they're keeping uh, Luis Robert or Dylan Cease right now. Their team seems like it's a mess. But um, what is kind of the over? Let's just talk about Bieber really quickly. Do you think that he is a, a guy that is likely to be moved? Or do you think that this is just people saying, oh, team that had bad record? Therefore, they're they're going to try and trade. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it feels like a degree of like Cleveland always sells, so they're probably going to sell. Yeah. Um, they they don't have like I said great depth right now in that rotation, and they have graduated most of their their guys. Espino missed all of last year with injury, and probably won't be back till mid season. So they don't have a ton of great options. I, I think they'll listen, um, but it's mm -hmm. Bieber is a weird pitcher. Um, you yeah. know, it's like Juan Soto is going to get 30 million plus in arbitration because he's been great every single year. Bieber yeah. is in his last year and he's at 12 because he's had weird up and downs. And uh, two of the last three years, he missed half the season with injury. And this is a guy who at peak, his number two pitch was his curveball. And since his injury, he's been afraid to throw it. And mm -hmm. it's very like, is there something wrong there? Is there a bigger like he's never had surgery with these big injuries? He's avoided that. But that curveball was his out pitch, and now he doesn't. They went from being something he was throwing like 28, 29 percent of the time last year was at 14, and it's not quite the same break and everything that that pitch was. So he's and he's had a big velocity drop from that 2020 campaign. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I never heard him tied to the sticky stuff, but people are going to discuss that whenever a pitcher has a a. It's more of a, but that's typically more of like a rotations per minute drop than a velocity drop. So there's a lot of weird stuff with him and it makes the threading the needle kind of difficult because Cleveland doesn't traditionally like to sell low, but he is a player making, you know, I believe $12 million is the estimate and is going to be a free agent. Um, you know, I, I think it's interesting from the other perspective too, of like, it used to be a big deal to trade someone like Shane Bieber in the off season because you could get a draft pick back mm -hmm. depending on the team that acquires him. You know, if, if the Padres were to trade for him, in season or yeah or before the season began they would net like what a fourth rounder if he walked like the the, the draft pick so. draft pick values aren't you know used to always be everyone gets yeah. a first now it's not that way anymore since mm. so 
I mean, yeah, you want to net a pitcher earlier to get more starts out of him, but it's not kind of kind of as valuable to get a guy in the off season as opposed to in season. And as we saw with, um, you know, Jordan Montgomery, good, good pitchers will net good prospects. The yeah. Cardinals got two very good prospects in that deal. So I, I think Cleveland can, uh, can make a trade. I, I don't know if they're actively seeking one. It can happen. Um, knowing people in and around that system, I can say uh, very quickly, I know one prospect that was held in high regard was Graham Polly, the outfielder um, mm-hmm. in his draft year. Yeah. Um, you know, our, that's our the, uh, mutual friend. Arm Layton is very high on him too. Is so. he? Yeah. No, I uh, just, I can say that I, I know some people that were, were extremely high uh, on, on Graham Polly in particular. And mm-hmm. uh you know, I don't know. You don't know how much is you, you hear a lot. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to sit here and, and make it sound like I'm hearing something directly from anyone on it and any piece, but I'm like, mm-hmm. I know there are those who have had ties to that organization that, uh, that certainly put him at a, at a high value. And I think that's, what's kind of interesting with the Padres in general is maybe they get viewed as the system's a little down, but I think sometimes people look at it through the wrong lens of like guys like Polly and Mark C are probably more valuable than, and I'm probably saying his name wrong, uh, then then they're perceived because of how much prospect rankings are reactionary. Mm -hmm. So the Padres still have a lot of talent and a lot of pieces where Mm -hmm. trade could conceivably happen. It just gets weird if you're trying to figure out the major league side of it, like how Mm -hmm. Cleveland can benefit their team now. Yeah, and I personally think that the Padres have replenished their farm really, really well. And I say that also in the context of how many trades they've made. I'm not saying that this is a top elite tier system, but considering that this team has done nothing but trades and traded Wood, Gore, Abrams, Susana, like all those guys just like a year and a half ago for Juan Soto, the fact that you have like your Merrills and you have Ethan Salas and then you have Snelling and Dylan Lesko and Graham Pauly as a sleeper. And then there's even some fun ones like Homer Bush. Like there's, there's a lot of like fun pieces here which means that i think that they're likely to or at least it's possible for them to make a move from my perspective i think bieber makes more sense as a mid-season one because then they're just back at square one um if because he could just walk and since they have their financial issues right now i don't know if that would make the most sense and like you said it's not like bieber's been blowing people away lately um there has been concerns like you've mentioned with the with the revolutions per minute a little bit of velocity stuff, the swings and misses. I remember when there was a time when I swear I just would check the game log and it's like two strikeouts, three straight starts. You know what I mean? And that was concerning because if you just, oh, he set a record, really? Well, he set a record for the most games in a row with eight strikeouts or more of any Cleveland pitcher in the history. And this is a franchise that's been around a long time. Yeah. And then this year he struck out eight eight hitters in like two games. Like he couldn't strike anyone out. Yeah, it's... And if you just were to look at it from the kind of the peripheral stuff and whatnot, strikeout rate has gone down basically every year, not basically, literally every year since 2020. Grant 2020 was an outlier, but it was an outlier for everybody. So 41%, then 33.1, 25%, and now 20%. So this is the type of guy that I think the Padres would rather say, maybe if we're, let's see if we're good first. You know what I mean? Like if we're good and halfway through the season, we might not even have to give up as much. Then let's say things are going right. Bogarts is back. Uh, you know, Machado is is back to his MVP form and Tatis is back to his MVP form. You get some of those depth guys that you get in the offseason potentially. Um, I'm going to assume that Soto isn't here at this time. Maybe you got some good players in return and you're just a solid team. I think it makes more sense then because if you would be giving up prospects now, I just don't. I, again, I just think that they'd be back at square one because they, if they gave up any of their pitching guys, it's like, why would you do that? You have weird concerns with your pitching. You're probably going to, lo- not probably, you're most definitely <laughs> likely going to lose the guy who just won the Cy Young. Then you've got issues with Darvish's health. And then you've got Musgrove, who's great. And then you have these two prospects you're excited about. And, you know, you can work some things. I personally wouldn't even mind taking a flyer on Frankie Matas these days, right? So I'm okay with it, but I just think. I don't know if it's a match at the moment. I think that there are other guys they'd be interested in. And frankly, I don't think that they're wild about the idea of just being in the same situation that they are right now, where they have not a lot of rotation depth and they don't have a lot of money to go out and replenish that because of all the contracts that they gave out. That's the negative of that whole thing. Um, Although it would be fun. Let me tell you, it would be fun. And I also think Preller 
is a lot of he doesn't tend to he he really likes buying high you know what i mean like bieber is a little bit on the down right now um and i'm not saying he can't turn it around i'm at, like i don't know enough about the guys uh, in terms of the mechanics as you do and others do like yeah maybe he comes back in this year and that strikeout rate is back up to 28 percent or whatever the heck and everyone's like oh cool like he's figuring out he's a really talented pitcher um but he doesn't usually go for guys when they're not pitching very well you know what i mean like this is a guy who traded for soto traded for darvish after darvish was a cy young candidate right trade for blake snell after that world series thing right like it doesn't seem like that's been his go-to especially for players of this caliber so i don't think that this would happen um is, is grisham the only guy to sell low? like because that was after he bombed <laughs> after he made that critical error i was like oh, trying to think God. of a case like, i mean that's the only guy i can think of you can argue the the little mini trades they made at the deadline with um, what's his face with Garrett Cooper and G Man Choi uh, and Scott Bar- Scott Barlow. Frankly, uh, yeah. you did because he was really off this past year, so maybe him. But like you like Grisham, yeah, that's kind of the only one. Uh, Adam Frazier, he bought super high on that wasn't yeah. a great trade. Um, yeah, I mean, I I can't really see uh, Xander Bogarts if we're talking about signings, but in general. This just doesn't seem like a. I think that he'd be more interested in going to deal with the Brewers again, who seem to be on the route of fire sale. Maybe I can't tell because every time someone tells me a team's going to have a fire sale, it almost never happens, except for the Cubs that uh, a couple years ago. It, it was like the like, one team that really did do it. But yeah, and, and the Nationals, but it feels like I, the, mm-hmm. the fans of our show are always like, hey, why can't this team trade for a power hitting outfielder? And it's like, yeah, specifically right. And we literally like, did the fan graphs list and there's like 20 right-handed outfielders who had or less than 20 who had 20 home runs last year. And it's like yeah. the problem right now more than anything else is, is not just that the league is kind of changing and shifting, but it's like, there's like five teams that, that are not competing next year, right? Like there's mm-hmm. going to be 25 teams out of the gate that think they have some degree of a shot and it just limits availability. But I agree with you. It feels like Cleveland, like, like I said, the whole thing with Bieber is, as a Guardians fan, uh, I've gone so back and forth and over this. It's like, do you hold on to him and see if he rebounds? Or do you sell now before you get not like there's an outcome mm-hmm. where he is an absolute stud at the end of the year and gets a massive contract. There's a, an outcome where they don't even offer him the qualifying offer. Like he could be yeah. anywhere in between and he injuries could be perfectly and healthy that. and not get the qualifying offer. I'm not even talking injuries. I'm just saying he could mm-hmm. have a, if he pitches how he pitched at the start of last year, it, it, he, he wasn't, he was Kyle Gibson last year for about yeah. the first two months. And uh, that's, I mean, yeah, Kyle Gibson just got what, $12 million. I mean, that's fine, but you're not trading a lot for him. So, you know, I, I do get a lot of people like, Hey, what would a trade look like for the guardians with Bieber? And it's like, it's just, it's hard to figure out because I don't know how teams view him and, I, yeah, he's hard. A, I don't know what people think yeah. of him either. Yeah. And I think he's the injuries. Like it's yeah, a lot of injuries what, of late. Yeah. That's what I meant by injuries. Like, is this guy about to go the route of like, I mean, this is like, like a Tim Lincecum where it's like, mm-hmm. everyone was talking about him for years. And then this first name that pops in my head or Lucas Giolito, who's, who's, I think it's finally turned, but like that guy was, in my opinion, for the past like couple years, like past two years, a little bit more name brand over real value. And then, you saw what happened on the Angels this yeah. year, where his first start, he's getting absolutely torched. So I'm not saying that's what's going to happen for Bieber, but I think you're right. And I think that there's just too much uncertainty with him as a pitcher that the type of team that trades for him is a team that's like, all right, you know what? We're kind of set up right now. Let's take a flyer on this guy as someone who could be our three or four and will feel really great about it. And there's like high potential there, like a like an Atlanta Braves or something like that, where they'd be like, I mean, I don't know if they have the the personnel to be able to trade for him like that. It's it's just such a weird player, and I can't get over like this. It's just it's just odd, and I think that Cleveland is probably in a in a weird spot to trade him too. Not to mention, I still think the division's really winnable. So yeah, it's like it's a I don't weird think that division. this is a it's a really <laughs> weird division. So it's like the the White Sox. Look at him. It's it's got him. Yeah. <laughs> it's got Jeff. He's like, oh the, my god. The White it's, Sox. I mean, the, the White Roy- Sox are a disaster. The, the Royals, Royals are, are a nonstop. Dumpster fire from the moment they won the World Series. Um, yes, absolutely. You know, it's just, it's just but, Minnesota, right? Yeah, it, it's like, yeah, it's great. The Tigers added Kent Maeda, but if they lose Eduardo Rodriguez and they've taken a step back, and yeah, exactly. I really like a lot of the young players, honestly, in mm-hmm. Detroit. They're the team that's kind of most fun to I watch. Feel so but, bad for Detroit. 
Come yeah, on. I mean, let's, yeah. Detroit sports needs a W. I know they got the Lions. I get it. I get it. But like, let's just, the Lions, have, the Tigers have been rebuilding since yeah. the Justin Upton contract. You know what I mean? Like, I don't remember. Like, yeah, they've been rebuilding for a long since Mike time. Illich passed. Like when the the, the owner yeah. who was, you know, he's like, oh, I'm a billionaire and I'm dying. I'm going to spend every dime I got to try to win. Yeah. And then when his son took over, it hasn't been quite the same. But uh, I mean, the twins, like, let's just be honest. There's no way you can replace Sonny Gray. Like, that's no matter what they say internally, that's that's an irreplaceable type of dude. Um, and they're up again. It's but it, this is kind of where it's bad for baseball, right? Like, it's a bad division and yeah. the teams know it's a bad division. So there's no incentive to try because, hey, yes. we can squeak by with a kind of cruddy. That's what the team. Brewers have been doing for years. Yeah. yeah. And it's like if we stay kind of cruddy, we don't have to spend as much. And like, listen, I. I love the Diamondback story this year, but let's be honest, the Diamondbacks had two starters. Yeah. You know, have we've never seen a bullpen game in the World Series before. Yeah. So it's like we see this stuff happen all the time. It's like you can slide through the one time Cleveland almost won the World Series in recent memories, the year that half their pitching staff got hurt in August and they had no business yeah. making it to the World Series. So this division de incentivizes competition right now, unfortunately. And I, Cleveland should have a shot at it. I mean, two years ago they had good health. Last year they had terrible health. It's you know. it's you're right though. That's it's that's such a great point. Like Milwaukee has been doing this for a while, mm-hmm. and I think Milwaukee is a pretty good team. But they've been really leeching off the fact that they basically for the past few years have only had to worry about the Cardinals. This year they didn't have to worry about anybody, <laughs> and then they still didn't do too much, and now they're having a fire sale because they and they don't want to pay Corbin Burns an extra two hundred or seven hundred forty k. Like that's where we're at. Where it's like these, and it's it's both central divisions too, and yeah. um. I think that with your team, in fairness, they they had the Puerto Rican King. Maybe that's part of why they were able to make the World Series, in my very unbiased opinion. That had a a, a big uh, impact on it. But yeah, man, I think that the Guardians are one of the weirdest teams to read. It feels like they never make the move, or not. How do how do I put this? It feels like they don't telegraph the move um, yeah. quite so much. Um, the Giants, uh, for Padres fans, they're a little bit similar. They don't usually telegraph. It usually kind of just happens. Um, so I feel like we won't hear, you know, the John Heyman, Jeff Passan updates. And for all those reasons, do I think the Padres give up prospects? Sure. I think they could throw out, um, I don't know, like a Samuel Zavala, uh, um, you know, and, and maybe an Adam Mazur, an Iriarte, someone of that caliber. I don't think they're trading, you know, Jackson Merrill for this guy, right? But no. I think that... They could maybe dip into the farm a little bit. I bet you it's one of those, hey, Cleveland, are you really down on this guy? Because because the, the thing that would make sense for the Padres is the only way for them to really keep their rotation good is through trades. They're not going to be able to sign one of these top guys. Everyone keeps talking about Yamamoto. Uh, the Yankees are in on him. Y'all ain't outbidding the Yankees right now. I'm sorry. Or, frankly, the Dodgers. That team has been quiet, a little bit too quiet by the way, and they need pitching desperately. So I just don't think they're going to be able to get a guy that's like 10 million a year. That's going to be really good for them. So Shane Bieber in theory would make sense, but because of the fact that you don't know exactly what you're getting from him, that he's a free agent after this year, Dylan cease, I think is the player that would make a lot more sense for them to be like, all right, maybe we'll give up um, a Snelling. Do I want to do that necessarily? I don't know. I, I, I have, it. I can't make up my mind. I kind of, I'm kind of down with just being like, you know what? Let's just, we have Bogarts, we have Tatis, we've got Machado, got Darvish, Musgrove, got some star players. We have enough, you have the amount of star players that teams that win the World Series usually have. Um, I'm a believer in you need them to go get over the hump. Um, anybody can have that Diamondback season. We see it all the time. But I want to have the guy who hits the game tying home run in game one. That's Corey Seager, and they spent for that guy. So I think the Padres have those dudes. So anyone listening from the Padres' perspective, even if they don't make one of those giant moves, I'm okay with taking some pot shots. Maybe Snelling comes up and is pretty effective. Heck, maybe they could get something on Matt Waldron. I don't know. Um, And you just take low-end shots. You get a decent return for Soto. And I'm willing to go with that because you already have the stars. If they didn't have any of these guys, I'd be like, what are we doing? Let's go. Like, just extend Soto or trade for or sign Cody Bellinger right before it. But since they have all those guys and because of the payroll, don't think that this is a, a perfect match, man. I don't think it is. But at the deadline, 
Maybe because Preller likes getting crazy at the deadline. Say Shane Bieber is doing all right. And if the Padres are good, I think that's the better route to take for a guy like Bieber is a wait and see. And then if you even, even if it means you have to pay up a little bit more at the deadline, Hey, if you're good, you're good. They still have a lot of high paid players on this team. So they're clearly a team that is built for um, potentially winning now. So that's my yeah, kind of thoughts on it. Yeah. And the cautionary tale of it is, uh, you know, last time Cleveland had an injured asset on an expiring contract who, uh, everyone thought they got ripped off by trading away their ace was a uh, Corey Kluber to the Rangers for Emmanuel Class A. Oh, I forgot about that. It was so, for Class A. Yeah, I forgot about that. It was Emmanuel Class wow. A and Delano De Shields Jr., which I said at the time, I go, I think this is a salary dump. I mean, he played the whole year in center field, so maybe it wasn't. Yeah, but yeah it was. You know, it, not the same situation because Kluber's highs were higher and he had a freak injury and it was kind of that random. Yeah. But the last time they were in this similar situation, if you want a cautionary tale of a team where like that went really bad, uh, yeah. that was the class A deal. Yeah. And didn't Kluber, wasn't it his first start too, I think? With, with, with the Rangers, yeah, he, I mean. He, he threw one yeah. inning. Yeah, he threw one. Okay, I remember one this. Inning. Yeah, that was like, man, that was rough. So, I mean, that that stuff just happens sometimes. Yeah. But, um, hey. We'll have to see. I'm sure that one of our teams will make a move this offseason. <laughs> what our, our team will make a move. You heard it here first, uh, everybody. The Guardians will make a move. And same thing for the Padres, especially the Padres, I imagine. Uh, no, we're, I, it's, we're, it sounds like the Soto deal is going to gonna happen at some point. So You know, and, and the Soto deal is going to be fascinating when it happens. In Cleveland, we're, we're, we're getting ready for the draft lotto. Like, that's, hey, we've never, we haven't had a top 10 pick since Clint Frazier. Like, we had this, uh, the the run under Tito went really well until his final year, and we have not picked higher than I think twelfth. Will Benson was the the previous high. Like this team has is been competitive for a long time. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I grew up in Cleveland. Uh, sports are have been awful almost my entire life, and uh, drafts are like uh, national holidays. So we're already gearing up for that. Um, you know, we're, we'll be prepared and ready for that. But yeah, that's that's probably our big move because uh, you know unless we decide to to chase this year's version of Josh Bell and Mike Zanino after seeing how well those have turned out every single year. It's, yeah. it's, it's... Bell really just hated y'all. <laughs> like he got traded and said, I see ya. I'm going to become uh, the uh, the predator. I, I mean, he was just insane. Like when he got there, his, his wife baseball. is from Cleveland. You would have thought that like, Oh, he's close to home. And yeah, no, nope. Maybe maybe it's too close to home. I don't know. Maybe he didn't like his in-laws or something. I thought that was but... going to be such a slam dunk, like classic Cleveland. All these teams getting these big free agents, and they're going to come in for Josh Bell, and he's going to be just as good as um, Jose Abreu. Now, he, he was might somehow... Have been. He, he might have been. <laughs> That's the funny part, but it's just like like everyone's talking about the big deals, and Cleveland's like, we're going to get this guy over here that we think is good. And for some reason, it didn't work, and I was shocked by that. But nonetheless, Jeff... What do you have that you'd like to cl- uh, plug for the people that you got coming up on your show um, or any final thoughts? You know, we uh, will be covering all the angles with the Guardians. Uh, I'll, I'll throw it out there. I, I do occasional draft content at uh, Prospects Live as well as I do like a, a mlbdraftout.blogspot.com. Uh, I've got a way too early mock. Uh, it's not the most active thing, but if you want additional content, I do some stuff there. And then Locked on Guardians, if you want Guardians talk. Uh, you can go listen to the Scott Barlow episode if you want more on Danielle. Uh One of the few pitchers in baseball who's thrown an immaculate inning. Love that. Absolutely love that. And if you guys want to check me out, again, that's at Hava Pena on Twitter, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. I've been inconsistent with my writing, but of course, going to be doing Lockdown Padres stuff, going to be talking about whatever. I mean, I think that the soda deal will be happening somewhat, maybe possibly soon. I mean, winter meetings are next week. We'll see what happens. So going to be talking about all that stuff. And if you want my writing, you can find it at just baseball. I recently did a feature on the internet game baseball for people who might be familiar with it. I know Jeff is. I liked it. Um, I I read it. I I never knew about it until it was over. And then it made me mad that I'd somehow missed (laughs) this thing that was perfect for me. I was like, I'm I I tweeted. I was sad too. I was like, I'm mad at Javi. I never even got to try this thing, and it looks awesome. So I, I highly recommend that article. Even okay, if you yeah. never played it. Like I said, I never played it, and I enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, everybody go check that out. It's pinned to my Twitter profile, so you'll find it there. I talked with the studio and everything. That was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. Until next time, my Fire Faithful homies and my gallon, gallivanting guardians people. I do this on every podcast. I try to do the double letter thing for every team. Uh, Until next time, everybody, take care.